Welcome to this Herbe Group podcast produced by our Medical Insight Studio. In today's episode, our clinical application manager, Dr. Niklas Fromo, is talking to Dr. Eric Heisinger, assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Dr. Heisinger is a board-certified pediatric pulmonologist who has received the Best in Pediatrics Award by the American Thoracic Society, ATS. In the last episode, Dr. Heisinger discussed general aspects of bronchoscopic procedures for pediatric patients and use of cryotechnology for treatment of foreign body aspiration and emergent recanalization in critically ill patients. In this episode, he will be discussing his rationale for debulking granulation tissue using cryotechnology, as opposed to other modalities, and the role this technology plays for palliation of central airway tumors. You have told me in an earlier conversation that you are also treating granulation tissue bronchoscopically. Um, mm -hmm. And let me maybe go to this, um, as prevention is always better than than treatment, which patients are under risk for such granulation tissue and how can you prevent its formation? Sure. Well, actually, so you mentioned in the granulation tissue, we were just uh, doing a case of this last week for a, a young lady who's uh, had a really very difficult time with the formation of granulation tissue. The, the kids that I see gran in the most are going to be patients that have uh, long-term needs for trachs and long-term needs for vents. Um, that's probably the most common area that we see. And we can see it from anything from suction trauma to problems with the, the cuffs creating damage to the tissue um, or uh, from the endotracheal tube itself rubbing into the mucosa and creating inflammation uh, distally. Another place where we've seen this has been in patients that are having endobronchial stents. Oftentimes the similar process is the presence of the, of the metal in the airway, which is usually we're using palm out stents. Uh, the presence of the metal is resulting in irritation of the tissue and frequently can get completely obstructed. So that's another place where we've had good use for it. There is a little bit of patients that we've had this with using for lung transplants and trying to make sure we maintain the anastomotic site. But fortunately, lung transplants are a fairly rare uh, thing to have to do in children. So I don't have a lot of those, but it does happen on occasions. But the bigger issue are the patients that have uh, chronic trachs and vents and uh, also uh, chronic stents in the airway. Would you say that the formation is more frequent as compared to adults? Probably. Uh, I'm not aware of anything that's directly comparing that, but at the same token, uh, children are going to have smaller airways. Uh, they're going to be more vulnerable to irritation, suction trauma, things along that line. Uh, in particular, with some of our kids that have unusual congenital airway problems, uh, they can be more prone to developing airway damage uh, related to intubation or uh, chronic trach use or suction trauma. So it's probably more common in kids, but I'm not aware of anything that specifically compares the two. Certainly, it's something that we end up having to deal with, uh, not terribly infrequently, unfortunately. You you already mentioned the the vulnerable mucosa in in children. So, any treatment would mean manipulation. What should the optimal treatment for granulation tissue be capable of? Well, I think the first thing is uh, to try to treat it is to prevent. Uh, the granulation tissue from forming in the first place. And so, and especially for kids that are trached, making sure that the trach is well positioned, that it's well seated, that it's not back walling or front walling, uh, that people are using appropriate suction uh, technique. Uh, many people will suction children the same way we, you suction an adult, which can cause trauma to the airway. And uh, needs to be care, need, really pretty great care needs to be taken to not do that. So prevention, I think, is the first thing that we need to be able to do. Uh, if we're going to have to do something that is um, more interventional for granulation that's already formed, ideally we can do something that's going to be uh, quickly done. That's not going to cause any pain for the kids. We will try some medication therapies, uh, and when those don't work. Uh, trying to do things uh, endoscopically uh, that uh, are going to put the kid at minimal risk and try to prevent their grand from reforming when it does happen uh, is going to be a key for us. Where in the therapeutic algorithm would you integrate cryotechnology? Ah. 
So what's what's the sure. the so, benefit of it? So uh, in terms of timing of using cryotherapy for granulation, I would say first thing, try to prevent it from from forming. So uh, using appropriate suction technique, positioning your uh, trachs or other devices that may be in the airway, positioning that uh, optimally so that you're not getting formation of granulation tissue would be step one. If that's not going to be effective. We will often try uh, some medical therapy, steroid drops or uh, Ciprodex drops, things along that line. If at that point we haven't had good success at alleviating the granulation tissue, that's usually the time at which uh, I would start doing endoscopic intervention, uh, trying to uh, remove the obstructive tissue from the granulation. When you perform cryo extraction of such granulation tissue, um, and you would need to give an advice to a colleague who wants to perform this for the first time, what kind of patient and what kind of, let's say, lesion by position or by um, morphology would you recommend him to do in a first case? Well, I think uh, trying to do it, if you're turning the first time, uh, using older patients with bigger airways is usually the uh, best place to begin with. Uh, it's, it's just technically it's an easier thing to be able to do bronchoscopy in general. The, the kids were grand that I've uh, had that have uh, really, cryo has really shined for me have been children that have had problems with recurrent granulation tissue uh, and particularly granulation tissue that's obstructing a, a significant fraction of the airway. So really greater than 50% uh, would be where I would start to think about that, especially if it's in the trachea, because the, that's the point at which most of the kids will tend to start complaining of more shortness of breath or wheezing or just difficulty breathing in general. So that's probably the place that I would start with is more proximal tissue in bigger kids that have significant airway obstruction. What else would I need to observe when I perform a cryo extraction of granulation tissue? I think you need to make sure that the uh, probe is going to be where you want it to go. So again, visualizing that you're actually hitting the granulation tissue with the probe and not some of the surrounding healthy mucosa is going to be an important thing to make sure that we're doing. Um, and being able to remove the tissue in block. Once tissue comes out, I think it's very important to get back into the airway quickly as well. Make sure that we haven't created any significant problems with bleeding. Uh, candidly, with doing cryo extraction for granulation tissue, I've really been quite pleased with the lack of bleeding that uh, I've seen uh, with removing tissue that way. I have done a lot of work with removing uh, granulation tissue with forceps uh, in children, and it is typically uh, quite challenging, and bleeding is often quite a major problem. I just haven't seen that uh, with doing cryo extraction in kids. I also think it's important, and we'll typically spend some time doing devitalization of the tissue Uh, that I've or doing devitalization around the site that I just did the tissue extraction with, trying to prevent granulation from reforming. And it had some sig pretty significant success with that. And we were mentioning earlier, I was uh, working with a patient this past week, and she had developed recurrent granulation tissue uh, probably about every two to four weeks, actually. And it would become obstructive within about a month. And we spent some time, I guess it was about a year and a half ago now, Uh, giving her her first uh, treatment with cryotherapy. And she just now came back for having some uh, more granulation reform been about a year and a half later. So I think adding devitalization to the tissue can be quite useful as well. You mentioned the devitalization aspect of cryotherapy. So repeated freeze and thaw cycles. How long and uh, how often would you freeze when having the intent to devitalize? Uh, so typically what I've done is if there's tissue that I'm trying to devitalize, usually using between 20 and 30 second uh, freeze thaw cycles. I do have some colleagues who have done up to a minute um, of doing freeze and thaw cycles and really just trying to go uh, around the entire area that's involved that we're uh, trying to devitalize the tissue. Um, once I have done that, I'm usually bringing the patient back. Uh, within probably two weeks, maybe within a week, depending on uh, how the patient's been doing and the extent of the work that we are doing uh, and repeating it. I've typically found it takes usually two cycles of treatment uh, to be able to get the result that I'm really looking for. I certainly see improvement within one, but uh, usually it's taking two, sometimes three. I don't think I've had anybody where I've needed to do more than three for acute management. 
with some of the patients that are uh, more tenuous and not necessarily waiting that week or two, uh, maybe coming back in a couple of days uh, to see how things are going, but usually a week or two has been about right for most of my patients so far. When we talk about devitalization, I think we should also mention debulking of airway lesions, which is not only interesting for granulation tissue, but also for other tumors that can require cryo extraction so to to be debulked which tumors do you frequently see in children that require a, a debulking with cryotechnology well fortunately tumors in the airway uh, is really pretty rare in kids so i don't know that i would say that there are any that we see frequently uh, but there certainly are airway tumors primary airway tumors that uh, we do deal with in children um, One area that uh, I've used cryo for has uh, to really just to open up an airway in an acute setting has been things like uh, carcinoid tumors or inflammatory myofibromas, uh, trying to open up the space and uh, help kids uh, be able to be more comfortable until they can get to more definitive surgery. In certain cases, actually having tissue knowledge Uh, from a cryo debulking and sending that off to pathology can actually prevent having to do larger uh, surgeries uh, such as wedge resections and you can uh, manage the airway with a combination of chemotherapeutics uh, and uh, really just maintaining the airway lumen. Actually, I know some colleagues of mine in Philadelphia have been uh, working on that currently. The other place that I've used uh, tumors to try to pull out are just masses in the airway, papillomatosis. Uh, the cryo has worked really quite well. The, those tend to come off very easily and as opposed to uh, trying to use laser therapy to be able to remove that tissue, which creates a lot of concerns about aerosolizing the papilloma and also uh, potential risk for airway fires. The cryo really seems to prevent both of those problems. And uh, histoplasmosis has been another place where I have uh, had some really nice success. We had one patient that uh, had about a 70% decline in lung function in the span of about 24 hours. Uh, and uh, she uh, had debulking using cryo and had almost instantaneous return to normal lung function. Really things went quite well. So several instances where you can do it um, and really have had very good success uh, removing tissue from uh, young kids' airways. Lucky for the young lady that she recovered so quickly, actually. What would be your rationale? When would you debulk? So when you would you freeze and pull? And in which patients would you rather devitalize? How do you differentiate between that? I think frequently I'm doing a combination of both, honestly. Um, the debulking, I think, is going to be the most important when you have very large amounts of airway lumen that's being occluded. So if I have an entire bronchus that has been completely obstructed, uh, trying to recannulate that bronchus by removing tissue uh, is, I think, really critical for uh, making patients have uh, more comfort and be less short of breath and things in that nature. Often we'll be doing devitalization at the same time once the larger obstructive lesion has uh, been done or has been removed, uh, trying to make sure that we don't have regrowth of whatever was causing the obstruction of the airway lumen to begin with and make sure we keep the patients feeling well and not having shortness of breath. In case you have a well-vascularized lesion, for, for example, carcinoid tumor, how do you deal with cryo, cryo debulking in these cases? So, are, are there any precautions that you need to, uh, to manage a bleeding that, that might occur? How do you handle this? Sure. And I think that is critical. Um, if you're going to be removing stuff from a pediatric airway, uh, you need to be prepared to deal with the complications that may occur. I think actually step one is knowing that you, this is in fact a, a tissue and not uh, a hemangioma. Uh, having a CTA before you're removing tissue can be really critical in children because one of the more common masses that we're going to see in the airway is a hemangioma. And if you try to pull on a hemangioma, you will invariably regret it. If in fact it's not a hemangioma and you're dealing with other forms of airway tumor, I think having a preparation for being able to deal with bleeding is still really important. So common things that we will use Uh, topical vasoconstrictors, particularly afrin and epinephrine, uh, we'll have on hand and ready to go uh, to be able to instill through the bronchoscope. 
ice sailing can be something else that's really quite useful. And I will say I have not had to use much beyond that at this point with the work that we've done. That said, always be prepared to intubate the contralateral lung or intubate beyond the lesion as well to make sure that we maintain airway if we're still having difficulty. Um, I think that's something that's critical to be prepared to do. Unfortunately, if we're having a flexible bronchoscope in the airway, the ability to secure the opposite side or to secure the airway distal to a tumor, you have the right equipment already in the airway and ready to go. So I think being prepared is a very good choice. Uh, and then also making sure that you know what you're pulling on, uh, and not pulling on something that's really likely to cause significant hemorrhage. All right. Thank you very much, Eric, for giving us a glimpse into your really rich experience in, in pediatric bronchoscopy. I know this is only touching a very little part of what experience that you have in, uh, in this uh, still young discipline. And um, I hope this is also interesting for our listeners uh, to learn uh, more about this evolving field. Thank you very much. Hey, Nicholas, I appreciate the invitation and uh, certainly look forward to uh, continuing to try to advance the fields of pediatric bronchoscopy and see what we can do to uh, better support our kids and uh, try to deal with some of the complications that seem to increasingly occur as we get better and better at uh, saving young kids' lives. Granulation tissue easily forms in the pediatric airway as a result of irritation and inflammation of the mucosa. Preventing such conditions is always better than treating them. When it comes to bronchoscopic intervention, the combined capacity with cryotechnology has to debulk and devitalize tissue, helps the physician obtain sustainable therapeutic results. Fortunately, tumors of the airways are quite rare in pediatric patients. Cryodebulking combines the capacity to evaluate tissue histopathologically and define the most appropriate and ideally gentler treatment option. In cases of papilloma, aerosolization of cells is not a concern when cryotechnology is employed. Keep up this great work saving children's lives. Thank you, Dr. Heisinger, for sharing your experience, which will be beneficial for other bronchoscopists as well, and Niklas for being here today. Stay tuned for our upcoming episode about cryotechnology. Thank you for listening to our Medical Insights Podcast, a podcast by the Urbe Group. To get further information and view our terms and conditions, please visit our website at www.urbe-med.com. <laughs>